good evening ladies and gentlemen a warm welcome to the third year of the learn from the legend series after successful completion of two years of the very popular webinar in neonatology uh, the culmination of which was at iap neocon 2022 held at thrissur kerala south india uh, last month today we have a legend for the session professor richard a paulin columbia university in new york usa he will be talking to us on fluid and electronic controversies in preterm in preterm infants this session will be moderated by two renowned neonatologists from india dr bijan saha from kolkata and dr major abhijit yv from bangalore dr bijan saha is a dm neonatology from all india institute of medical sciences and he is the associate professor of neonatology at ip gme and r and sskm hospital kolkata is areas of interest are non invasive ventilation nrp infection control etc etc and he has published numerous peer reviewed papers and books in various chapters in renowned books and the next moderator is major dr abhijit yv he has done post graduation in pediatric nutrition qualified from boston university of medicine usa he is a member of international pediatric association vaccine test scores qualified and the ncc pvp 20th skill development program on pharmacovigilance of medical products march 2022 and qualified for ministry of health and family welfare government of india He has done a government certified course on hospital management, March 2022, qualified Ministry of MSME, Government of India. His CV goes on and on, so I would like to, I would like to, uh, I would like to stand in your way between the academic session and the introductions. over to you dr manoj for further introduction of the eminent speaker we have today thank you thank you sir hello everyone let me begin by thanking each and every one of you for attending and making the second anniversary of learn from the legends iap neocon 2022 one of the most memorable international neonatology summits post pandemic thank you all from the bottom of all our hearts and a very hearty welcome to all of you to the first session in the third year of learn from the legends international neonatology webinar series today we have one of the greatest legends of neonatology professor richard a polin the no name that is known to all and each and every one of us Dr Richard Polin is a William T Speck professor of pediatrics at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and is the immediate past director of the division of neonatology at Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital of New York Presbyterian from July 1977 when most of us would have been in the schooling years or in the early graduation period until january 1998 dr polin was a faculty member in the division of neonatology at the children's hospital of philadelphia and professor of pediatrics at university of pennsylvania in 1998 
Professor Polin returned to Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital in New York Presbyterian as the director of neonatology. And in the spring of 2006, Dr. Polin received the National Neonatal Education Award from AAP section on perinatal pediatrics. And in 2017, he was inducted into the prestigious AAP's Legends Hall of Fame. He is also one of the recipients uh, in the year 2021. He is the recipient of the prestigious Virginia Abgar Award from the American Academy of PDR, the, the greatest honor a person can get. 2021. Professor, to go on his introduction, he will run into pages. So I will just cut it short. Dr. Paulin uh, has published over 200 original papers. Most of us are read during our student days and even re keep reading now. 20 books, including fetal and neonatal physiology, some of our favorite books. Workbook in practical neonatology, pediatric secrets and fetal and neonatal secrets, one of my favorite books. He has more than 200 abstracts, published more, more than 200 abstracts as well. He is the chair of NICHD Neonatal Research Network uh, Executive Steering Committee and he is also the past chair of sub board of neonatal perinatal medicine intentionally i am cutting short the introduction i don't want to stand between you and the greatest legend we have with us hearty welcome once again sir professor richard Pauling. over to you so thank you very much Manoj, for that Fantastic introduction. I am really uh, delighted to be speaking to you this morning. When I say you, I realize it's not just India. Uh, it's, it's listeners throughout the world. So hello to you uh, also in, in different time zones. I am honored to be included in the series, Learn from the Legends, because uh, I've seen some of the other speakers and they are people who I consider to be legends. So this morning, I'm going to talk about morning for New York, by the way. One of my favorite topics in neonatology, and that's fluid and electrolyte controversies or management in our preterm babies. And before I go on, I want you to look at this uh, little diagram on the left part of the slide. You see two kinds of nephrons. One over here is considered a juxtamedullary nephron with a long loop of Henle. And the one down here is a uh, outer cortical nephron with a short loop of Henle. It's important clinically because in the immediate newborn period, most of the blood flow in the newborn infant, especially our preterm babies, is to the juxtamedullary nephrons. And it's after several weeks that the, the uh, blood flow switches to the outer cortical nephrons. And because of the short loops of Henle, when it, preterm infants are several weeks old, they frequently develop hyponatremia because they're less able to reabsorb sodium in those shorter loops. So here are my objectives for this morning's lecture. I want to provide a brief overview of renal function during the fetal life. Then I'm going to focus on some of the uh, developmental limitations in our preterm babies. And then I'm going to discuss some physiologic principles, what happens during the time of transition. And finally, I will provide you with some recommendations. So I think the most important takeaway from this lecture is to understand the physiology that uh, affects newborn infants and in, especially preterm babies in the immediate newborn period, I will provide some specific recommendations. So this is a very classic slide, actually from before the time I went to medical school, it was in 1961 by Fries Haas and was published in Pediatrics. And it looks in the changes in body water compartments through fetal life, the dotted line is term pregnancy and then postnatal life. And as you can see, during fetal life, babies are mostly water. Uh, they're about 95% body water, and that decreases as in, infants reach term gestation. It's not decreasing because in, the fetus is losing water. It, it, it decreases because the fetus is acquiring minerals, protein, and fat. During fetal life, the extracellular fluid space is higher and then the intracellular fluid space because that's um, the extracellular fluid space is related to to uh, house the rapid division of cells, uh, which decreases toward term gestation when the fetus increases its size by an increase in intracellular water. So here we have a large extracellular fluid space. 
because of cell multiplication. Here we have an increasing intracellular fluid space uh, because of an increase in cell size. At term gestation, the fetus has about 3,000 mLs of water, about somewhere about 80 to 100 mLs per kilogram is intravascular, uh, 1,000 mLs is intracellular, and the rest is in this extracellular fluid space. The fetus received most of its water uh, through the placenta, through uh, spe specialized protein channels, which can be either transcellular or paracellular, and those are called aquaporins. There's sort of the, the plumbing of uh, the plumbing site of transfer of water, and the amount of water transferred depends on hydrostatic and osmotic forces. You're going to see in a few minutes that there are a number of significant um, variations in the amount of fluid the fetus receives in exchanges with amniotic fluid or the maternal circulation. But net, in, net flux of the fetus is only about 20 mLs per kilogram per day. During the first trimester, uh, amniotic fluid is isotonic with plasma and comes right through the fetal skin or across the placental first uh, surface. And then with advancing gestation, the fetus urinates more and more into amniotic fluid. That urine um, is dilute and decreases the sodium concentration and osmolality of the amniotic fluid. And there's also a certain amount of fluid which comes out of the lung, uh, and that is almost the same as maternal serum osmolality. This is looking at urine production rates or urine flow rates, and you see a lot of dots over here. It looks at 20 weeks through station through 40 weeks of station. I want you to concentrate on this blue line up here because that's probably the best data you, using three-dimensional ultrasonography to look at emptying of the bladder in the fetus. And you can see, it may surprise you, that at term gestation, the fetus is urinating about 50 mLs per hour. That's much higher than we're used to seeing postnatally. Uh, so that translates in, into, you know, uh, a, quite a, a large urine output. And that's based on these data. Again, this is the original article uh, by Lee et al. in 2007. And if you look at the 50th percentile at 40 weeks gestation, it's even a little greater than uh, 50 mLs per hour or somewhere between 15 and 20 mLs per kilogram per day. There are some babies though, you can see if you look at the 75th and 95th, uh, 90th percentile that are urinating into the amniotic fluid at a rate of over 150 mLs per hour. The highest volume of amniotic fluid is not a term gestation. It's probably a 34 to 36 weeks gestation and then decreases uh, with post-maturity. And this slide looks at the exchanges between the fetus and the placenta and the fetal circulation. I'm gonna put numbers on these exchanges in just a moment, but you can see the fetus urinates into the amniotic fluid, and uh, that's especially contributing in the, in the second half of pregnancy. The fetus has fluid coming out of the lung. Uh, some of that is swallowed again. And there's something called the intramembranous pathway. It's a very important pathway. This is an exchange between the uh, amniotic fluid and the fetal circulation. And these are the numbers I said I would show you in just a moment. moment. So the fetus urinates somewhere about 1,000 mLs a day. It figures into about 50 mLs per hour. Swallows somewhere between 500 and 1,000 mLs per day. Lung fluid from the fetus is estimated to be about 340 mLs. About half of that gets put into amniotic fluid, and the rest is, is, is again swallowed by the fetus. There's a small amount of... Um, uh, water that comes off the fetal saliva, perhaps as high as 25 mLs per day. And there's in, this intramembranous pathway, which is quite important because this pathway is going from the amniotic fluid back into the fetal circulation. There's also another pathway, which probably is not very important, transmembranous pathway, which goes amniotic fluid back into the maternal circulation. But let's take a look at renal function and start with the most studied of all renal functions, that's GFR or the lamellar filtration rate. And it's no secret to any of you that GFR is diminished in all newborn babies. That's especially true about our preterm population. Renal blood flow is this decreased during fetal life. Uh, in fact, the, the um, kidneys receive about 5% of cardiac output during fetal life. And in URI, it's probably closer to 25% of cardiac output. 
And the reason it's so low is decreased perfusion pressure and increased vascular resistance. I've already mentioned this, but not all of the glomeruli are functional in the newborn kidney. There's pre preferential blood flow to those juxtamedullary nephrons with the long loops of Emily. And there's also a smaller glomerular pore size. Clinically, you all know this, it's in a small sick baby, it's very easy to make them indemnous by administering those babies too much salt or water. These are human data looking at GFR as measured by the clearance of inulin. Inulin is one of the standard ways and probably the most accurate way of estimating GFR in babies. And as you can see here, during the period of nephrogenesis, there's a, um, a slow increase in GFR until about 35 weeks gestation, where it remains relatively constant. And then at the time of birth, there's this rapid increase in the male filtration rate. And if a baby is born at 36 or 35 weeks gestation, they still have this rapid increase in GFR. But if they're born during the period of nephrogenesis, the uh, increase in GFR is, is more muted. And here are data from uh, Bueva and Guignard. As you may or may not know, Guignard is really the, I would call him the father of neonatal nephrology. And unfortunately he died just a short time ago. But these are data from his lab on human newborn infants looking at creatinine clearance. And creatinine clearance is often expressed as mLs per minute per body surface area in the adult 1.73 meters squared. And as you can see here in our term shown in green, there's this rapid increase in GFR, but with increasing degrees of prematurity, if you look at 1,000 to 1,500 grams shown in red down here, the rise in GFR is much more muted. When do we reach our normal GFR for an adult? Probably between 12, uh, and 18 months, and these are other data from Dr. Uh, Gignard. We, we all rely on creatinine to give us sort of a quick look at how the baby's renal function is. And these are data from my own division, published in Pediatric Research uh, just a couple of years ago. It's a cross-sectional study. And on this slide, we're looking at babies as young as 25 weeks and as mature as 33 weeks. A couple of things to note. In black are the mean creatinine values from day zero, day six to eight, day 10 to 15, and day 30 to 35. And as you can see here, the mean values, even in our most immature babies are all less than one. And the parentheses are shown two standard deviations for the mean. And you can see here that in our smaller premature babies, it's normal to have a plasma or serum creatinine value greater than one for about the first two weeks of life and then it should fall. The other thing worth noting is that creatinine progressively decreases with increasing postnatal age. Now, the, an exception may be these very tiny infants, but in all other babies, creatinine just went from 0.98 to 0.84, 0.69, 0 0.41, it decreases. One of the ways we identify renal failure or acute, AKI, acute kidney insufficiency in babies is by looking at a creatinine that doesn't change from day to day. Even though the creatinine may be in a normal range for your laboratory, if it doesn't change, that's probably a good indicator the baby has AKI, and that baby is at risk for complications in adulthood. And these are data on term babies with the average serum creatinine value is 0.4 to 0.5. So here's a graphic look at those values that I showed you. So in our smallest babies, the creatinine goes up and then comes down. In our 20 to 29 week gestation, it goes down um, a little faster. And in our more mature babies, 30 to 33 weeks, it goes down even quicker. Creatinine is, is not a great marker of renal function. We know that it's derived from phosphocreatin in muscle and therefore muscle mass can vary in newborns affecting creatinine values. And postnatally, serum creatinine in newborn babies represents maternal creatinine value I have on this slide for several days, but it's probably at least for 48 hours. And there's something very interesting physiologically in newborn babies, that creatinine is reabsorbed in the proximal tubules of newborn. Therefore, the use of creatinine probably underestimates the true GFR in babies. And it's not a very sensitive marker to small changes in GFR. 
there have been a whole other group of substances people have, have spoken about as better than creatinine. A lot of them involve time, urine collection, like inulin is probably the gold standard. I show you some data on that. Creatinine uh, closely correlates um, with inulin, but at very low levels, creatinine clearance overestimates the true GFR, as I've already said. People are beginning to look at aminoglycoside clearance, uh, but it's, there's not enough studies to say it is better than the other methods. And cystatin C has been touted at least as a good marker, but it's not uh, borne out in more recent studies. Clinically in the NICU, I like to use the Schwartz formula. And to do the Schwartz calculation of GFR, you need a plasma creatinine uh, and a, a, the baby's length in sonometers. And the formula goes creatinine clearance equals a constant, which is 0.33 for preterm babies and 0.45 for our term infants times the baby's length in centimeters divided by the serum creatinine value. And that actually gives you a pretty good estimate of the GFR in babies. And we use it clinically to look at what's happening in GFR postnatally. And it correlates where we've looked at in the past with uh, clearance of inulin. Let's move now on from GFR to sodium. And preterm babies, unfortunately, waste sodium quite well. And if you look at what's called the fractional excretion of sodium, shown over here is this value over here, it is high in preterm babies. And that's because all segments of the nephron, proximal distal tubules, loop of Henle and collecting duct, all waste sodium. Although most sodium reabsorption is in the proximal tubule. And as babies mature postnatally, the, and the, sodium, the fractional sodium ex, uh, excretion decreases, um, that's largely due to an increase in proximal tubule reabsorption of sodium, although all parts of the nephron mature. And somewhere about 32 weeks, babies stop wasting sodium. And these are data from uh, Lisa Satin's laboratory at Mount Sinai, looking at babies from 23 weeks up to 30 to 31 weeks gestation. And on the y-axis is fractional excretion of sodium. On the x-axis is postnatal age in weeks, up to five weeks. And you can see in our most immature babies for the first few weeks of life, there's a higher than normal fractional excretion of sodium. But when you get at babies at 30 to 31 weeks, they may have a higher fractional excretion of sodium, maybe for a week, but by the time they reach 32 weeks, they should be able to hold on to sodium quite effectively. And here's sort of a clinical pearl that I, I think is an important part of our management in the NICU, that if you have a baby who's wasting sodium, sodium conservation will improve if the extracellular fluid space, really meaning the intravascular space, is allowed to contract. And in fact, if you give too much fluid, and that's, this is probably the most common cause of electrolyte abnormalities we see in the NICU, it causes sodium to be wasted, calcium, phosphate, glucose, and some babies will waste bicarbonate and get a metabolic acidosis. So your first thought in a baby with hyponatremia is should always be fluid restriction and allow the intravascular compartment to contract. Now, the problem with potassium is just the opposite of sodium. Uh, potassium excretion is lower uh, during the first several weeks, but reaches values uh, achieved by term babies in three to five weeks. And these are relatively recent data that say that our very preterm babies have a defect in aldosterone secretion, but normal sensitivity to aldosterone. And these are data from one of my former faculty members, Jack Lorenz, looking at serum potassium value, excuse me, plasma potassium values in ELBW babies less than 1,000 grams. And you can see here they rise in the first day or two of life. And by 120 hours, they, day four or five, they come back to a completely normal value. Now, something that I've seen in my career several times is this uh, syndrome of non-oliguric hyperkalemia. And by the use of the term non-oliguric, these are babies who are urinating normally, but who have very high serum potassium values. And we mostly see it in babies less than a thousand grams. And although we and others have looked at the mechanisms responsible for non-oliguric hyperkalemia, it's pretty clear that the mechanism is decreased sodium potassium ATPase, 
which allows potassium to leak from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular intravascular space. Hyperkalemia is generally defined as a plasma potassium greater than five or a serum potassium greater than five and a half. Clinical signs are pretty rare if it's less than six and a half. And the clinical effects, especially on the heart, are potentiated by hypocalcemia. And I've seen cardiac arrhythmias in babies who have very high serum or plasma potassium values. In fact, I would tell you the most common cause of death uh, in these babies it, that I've seen has been ventricular arrhythmias uh, brought on by the hyperkalemia. And we still see it, although it's less common because antenatal steroids uh, increase sodium potassium ATPase and make the syndrome less common. But again, even last year, we had two twins who were about 23 weeks gestation, uh, both of whom died from non oliguric hyperkalemia. You should think about treating this entity if in any baby with potassium greater than seven or even a lower value if their EKG changes. So if I see a potassium of six, I have the residents get an EKG. It almost always occurs in the first 72 hours of life. And the treatments depend on whether there's EKG changes. So calcium, intravenous calcium is indicated when there are EKG changes, but controversial if there are no ECG changes. Sodium bicarbonate has limited efficacy. If there's not a metabolic acidosis, it shouldn't be given because it reduces the potassium lowering effects of some of our main treatments, which are insulin and glucose and beta agonists. Insulin plus glucose in this kind of formula is an evidence-based treatment. Furosemide diuretics, there's really no studies to demonstrate efficacy. Ion exchange resonance, but resonance we used to use are ineffective, potentially dangerous. As a last ditch effort, I've used exchange transfusion with a fresh whole blood. Pertinue dialysis is difficult technically. And now we're going more and more to the use of inhaled um, beta agonists. Uh, and the one that's been studied is albutamol, also called salbutamol. Uh, it stimulates that enzyme, which is uh, allowing potassium to leak out of the cell, sodium potassium ATPase. And there's a limited number of studies. There's one randomized uh, clinical trial showing that uh, albuterol in this doses in this dose, given every two hours, was better than placebo in lowering the serum potassium from seven, excuse me, down to six and down to a little under, uh, uh, under six. And then there is observational studies to show that um, intravenous uh, subutamol of, uh, compared to kaexalate and subutamol was more effective. Now let's turn to a really important topic and that's loss of fluid through the skin and respiratory tract. And that's called, as you know, insensible water loss. Insensible water losses are greatly increased in preterm babies. They have a large surface area to body mass ratio. The magnitude of insensible loss to the skin depends on the physical environment. So in a very high humidity environment, losses are less. In a, a, an environment which is not as, uh, not as humid and sensible water losses are greater. In our intubated babies, we've actually measured this, respiratory water losses are reduced to zero. So a number of years ago, we became very interested in measuring insensible water loss in our preterm population. And the first studies we did were looking at babies in a humidified isolate, shown in the red line. And it's, it's sort of linear, smaller babies had higher insensible water losses. And then we turned our attention to radium warmer beds, and we saw this kind of um, curve where the in babies under a kilogram, there's this exponential increase in sensible water losses uh, with um, in babies who are extremely tiny. And we published those data and felt pretty good that they were accurate until Jack Sinclair uh, from Canada took the method by which we were measuring insensible water loss, was, which was called the Potter baby scale. The Potter baby scale is a very sensitive scale actually invented by Mr. Potter. And it could measure a baby's weight that's being lost through evaporation uh, from the skin. So what Dr. Sinclair did, he took the 
Potter baby scale and put it in a radiant warmer bed without a baby and show that the scale lost weight. So we were pretty embarrassed by that observation. It's still true that babies on a radiant warmer bed lose more fluid than babies in a humidified isolate, but it's probably not at the magnitude that's shown uh, from our earlier studies. The better, or I think the best methodology to measure sense water loss is called, uses the transcutaneous evaporometer. And these are data from Sedin and Hammerlin from a number of years ago. And the numbers on the right are cc's per kilogram per 24 hours. And you can see here in our very immature gestations, here's the average birth weight. Insensible water losses can be greater than 100 mLs per kilogram per day at 50% relative humidity. I'm gonna tell you in a second that we tend to use significantly higher relative humidity in our isolates. But as the skin matures, the, by day seven, it's only a third of what it was at the time of birth. So it's related to skin matur maturation or skin keratinization that insensible water losses decrease so quickly. And in term babies, it doesn't really vary much. It's probably in the order of five to 10 mLs per kilogram uh, per 24 hours. So this is what we used to do when babies in, uh, who were nursed on a radiant warmer bed to decrease insensible water losses, we used to cover them with a thin plastic wrap. In the US, you buy that in a food store and then the nurses would put some tape around the edges. And when a baby lies underneath, underneath this kind of environment, the insensible water losses closely match those in a baby in a humidified isolate. Now, probably the most important thing I'm gonna talk about during this lecture is the changes in body water compartments. Now, we've already talked that Babies start off with a lot of water. Extracellular fluid is high because of growth by cell multiplication. Intracellular water then increases by uh, an increase in cell size. But postnatally, all babies exhibit a diuresis. That's an increase in urine output. So all babies have an increase in postnatal diuresis. In healthy babies, it probably occurs in the first day of life. In babies with RDS, it's delayed it most commonly until about the second day of life. And in babies who do not diaries as early as we would like, that has been shown to be a risk factor for bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And these were the original studies I did when I was at Children's Hospital Philadelphia. And on the y-axis over here is urine output uh, as a percentage of fluid intake. The big 80, is shown over here, and that's how we defined a diuresis as a urine output, at least 80% of fluid intake. And you can see here that somewhere, and these are study periods, but they're each eight hours. So somewhere in the second day of life, babies have a dramatic increase in urine output, which is sustained for several days and then comes down. The blue line represents AA gradients. The higher AA gradients, it's signifying more severe RDS at the bottom lower AA gradient signifying recovery at the top. And you can see here that the baby starts to diurese before the AA gradient, a gradient becomes normal. In other words, the lungs are, are, uh, are acting physiologically normal. So it looked like when we did these original studies back in the 80s, that diuresis was important to recover from respiratory distress syndrome, maybe because the lung was getting rid of water and that allowed better pulmonary function. The other thing that happens with the diuresis, and it's important nutritionally, is that a baby who may be growing at the 50th percentile uh, in utero, when they have this diuresis, drops down to about 10th percentile. And then as you know, one of the things that we have to do is provide enough calories and protein for allow the baby to then catch up to uh, as close to the 50th percentile as possible. So the key question is what's happening during that diuresis? What are the changes in body composition with recovery from RDS? Now I should say now that surfactant has changed the natural history. So this slide I showed you over here are babies who did not get surfactant and surfactant um, can improve oxygenation that may be unrelated or not related to the diuresis itself. Now to measure body fluid spaces, you have to inject a an indicator. To measure plasma volume, you inject Evans Blue. To measure extracellular fluid space, you use sucrose or bromide. 
And total body water is you inject a non radioactive isotope called deuterium. And you can go through some simple calculations. <clears throat> Intracellular volume equals total body water minus the extracellular volume measured by sucrose or bromide. Interstitial volume is extracellular volume minus plasma volume. Again, extracellular volume is measured by sucrose or bromide, plasma volume by Evans Blue, and body solids equals body weight minus total body water. Most of you probably not know, know the name Carl Bauer. He was an investigator both in Germany and at Brown University in the United States. And he did these classic studies looking at body water compartments in babies who were recovering from RDS. And this was the first of his studies published in the late 1980s, showing that if you look at babies uh, when they're first born, and then six or seven days later, their weight decreases, and the decrease in weight exactly corresponds to the decrease in extracellular fluid volume. And to use this, he used uh, sucrose as a measure of extracellular fluid volume. But as you know, extracellular fluid space has two components. It has interstitial volume and it has plasma volume. So Dr. Bauer went on with these studies, again, looking at babies on the first day of life and day six to 12, showing that yes, they do decrease body weight. That's already been shown. Total body water as measured by deuterium decreases. Extracellular volume as measured by sucrose also decreased from 468 to 370. But then they're left with the question, is it coming out of the interstitial fluid space, perhaps the lungs, or is it coming out of the, the plasma volume? And in fact, plasma volume uh, measured by Evans Blue was unchanged, whereas interstitial volume went from 419 to 318, saying that the fluid or the decrease in extracellular volume is almost all from the intercellular fluids, interstitial fluid space. Um, and, and that makes sense that the fluid might be mobilized in the lung to improve pulmonary function. And this is an important corollary to all that. An infant does not have to lose much weight to undergo contraction of the extracellular fluid space. When you are aggressive with your nutritional supplementation, contraction of the extracellular fluid space will occur, but weight loss will be minimized because of expansion of the intracellular compartment. So these are all also data uh, that Carl Bauer partic uh, participated in. And it looks at two groups of babies, pretty small study. Group one had weight loss of greater than 10% of their uh, from birth. Group two got aggressive nutrition and had weight loss less than 5%. And just like we talked about before, in babies who are not getting aggressive nutrition, the weight decreases, the extracellular fluid space also decreases. And we know that most of the extra fluid space is coming from the interstitial component of the lung. On the other hand, when babies were given aggressive nutrition, their extracellular fluid space still decreased. There was almost no significant change in weight. At the same time, their intracellular volume, shown over here, increased dramatically, which makes the point, as I said before, that as long as you allow the extracellular fluid space to contract, uh, babies can pre be prevented by losing much weight by providing aggressive or uh, uh, aggressive nutrition and increasing their intracellular fluid space. There's some interesting things that happen during the time of diuresis. Early in the diuretic phase, there's a significant increase uh, in free water clearance, during, causing a rise in serum sodium, followed by a marked increase in the fractional excretion of sodium causing the sodium to fall. And that's important to realize. Many times in the NICU, I see babies of a sodium of 148, 149, and the resident wants to give more water as they just wait a day because that as soon as the baby starts to increase their fractional sweetness of sodium, the sodium concentration will fall in the serum. The increase that occurs later in the diuretic phase is thought to be triggered by atrial natriuretic peptide. So let's move on to therapy. And here are some basic principles. In caring for our critically ill preterm babies, you want to allow for physiologic contraction of the extracellular fluid space, which means as a principle, you want to use fluid restriction. The concentration of glucose in the effusate will depend, will depend on the rate of, of fluid administration. 
we tend to limit sodium and potassium intake, sodium and potassium intake until after the diuresis is, is well established. Uh, potassium, because we worry about non oliguric uh, hyperkalemia, and sodium, we worry about uh, increasing body sodium, and it's been shown to be a risk factor for uh, BPD. We routinely give calcium to our babies intravenously. It maybe prevents some bone demineralization, but it probably doesn't work to prevent hypocalcemia. Fluid restriction is evidence-based. This is from uh, Ed Bell's look at in 2014, looking at the, at the outcome of PDA of restricted versus liberal fluid intake, showing that um, uh, restricted fluid intake decreased the risk of PDA in this meta-analysis. Here is restricted versus liberal looking at the outcome of NEC. This is also significant. Here's the risk ratio and confidence intervals. And here's looking at the outcome of BPD. And there's certainly a trend that fluid restriction is better for BPD, but does not reach statistical significance. And I mentioned this, and it's why should sodium be restricted? Here's a study we did in the 80s showing that sodium restriction during the first three to five days of life decreased BPD, very small study. And more recently, Hartnell in the archives did a similar study uh, and showed that delaying sodium supplementation until the baby had lost significant weight had a beneficial effect on the need for oxygen. So I look at three phases when I'm thinking about fluid and electrolyte replenishment. What I call the transitional phase is the first three to five uh, days of life. And here we have uh, babies of various weights. And you can see here, you try to have, um, excuse me, as little weight loss as possible. For a baby under a thousand grams, we like to have our maximum weight loss of being about 10%. In our bigger babies, we talk about five to 8%. We provide more fluid uh, to our smallest preterm babies. Uh, the numbers here are 10 to 20% left less with a humidified isolate or plastic shield. And we try to give very little sodium, potassium, and chloride. Um, it's impossible not to give sodium or to restrict sodium completely because there's sodium in the antibiotics we use. We try to give the minimum. The end of this transitional phase, you can recognize it because urine output starts to tail off. Maybe the diuresis ends, so it goes from uh, increase urine output to a, uh, approximately one ml per kilogram per hour. The urine becomes more concentrated. Uh, if you measure the specific gravity, it's generally greater than 10, 12. And more from a laboratory viewpoint, the fractional excretion of sodium goes down, and that's because you're restricting fluid and the intravascular volume is also decreasing. This is the stabilization phase. And you see that you'd like not to have weight loss in any of these babies during this phase generally between one and two weeks of life, they get about the same amount of fluid and um, you're giving sodium, maintenance sodium, chloride and potassium, either as a uh, TPN or a combination of uh, breast milk formula and TPN. And in general, in our NICU, our birth weight is regained in about 10 to 12 days. Some centers do even better than that. And finally, there's the growth phase. And that, that's beyond two weeks of life. And the growth phase um, is about 15 to 20 grams per day for babies less than 1,000 grams. More than 1,000 grams is 15 to 20 grams per kilogram per day. And, and that growth is met by feeding babies formula or breast milk, and they're getting uh, sodium and potassium chloride, which is needed for growth. So in conclusion, choose an initial rate of fluid administration based on gestational age and the physical environment. In our babies under 1,000 grams that we care for in humidified isolates, we rarely give more than 100 mLs per kilogram per day. As we start to get bigger premature babies, we drop that down to 80 mLs per kilogram per day. If you have a tiny baby that's on a radiant warmer bed, you can decrease insensible water losses by covering them with a thin plastic wrap. We start off with, I mentioned this, with a much higher relative humidity in babies under 1,000 grams is generally about 75%. Some centers use even a higher relative humidity, uh, closer to 100%. We do not do that, 
because it produces a big fog bank in the Iceland and stuff to see the babies. But it's important, whatever number you start off with, to then reduce the relative humidity over about a week down to about 50%. If you don't do that, there's been actually a, a uh, one randomized trial, it prevents the skin from maturing and those babies have increased in sense of water loss. We try not to give sodium or potassium until after the diuresis has occurred. Make sure that rate of glucose administration is adequate, which is four to six milligrams per kilogram per minute. And just as a, uh, something that I think is important, when you decide what, how much glucose to use, don't think about it in a concentration off the shelf. Because if you look at this theoretical graph over here, where they're using 10% dextrose at different rates of infusion, I call it plan A, plan B, and plan C. At plan A, they start off with 60, then go up to 80 mLs per kilogram per day or 100. And plan B, they use much higher rates. And plan C, they're constant with uh, 100 mLs per kilogram per day. And plan A, if you're using 10% dextrose, you're probably giving insufficient dextrose. And even by day two, if you're using 10% dextrose, you're probably giving borderline amounts of maintenance glucose. Not until day three will the amount of glucose be sufficient and the baby uh, on the first two days is at risk for hypoglycemia. If you choose a lot of fluid on day one, you're already giving uh, more than we generally give, which is four to six milligrams per kilogram per minute. And then by day two or th day three, the baby's at risk for hyperglycemia. And plan C, which is the one we generally follow, we do not increase maintenance fluids over the first three days of life. And you can see here with 10% dextrose at this plan, you're providing maintenance glucose to the baby. So here's my conclusions. Begin parental nutrition. And we generally do it always on day one uh, to lessen postnatal weight loss. Our babies are getting 10% dextrose uh, plus two grams per kilogram of protein. We usually start uh, lipid preparations on day two. Uh, we do provide additional calcium, although I don't think it has any role uh, in preventing hypocalcemia. And I can say that based on this old study from Reggie Sang's laboratory in Cincinnati, in which they compared babies who got no supplemental calcium, babies who got 400 milligrams per kilogram per day of calcium gluconate as a drip or bolus calcium, 200 milligrams per kilogram every six hours. And they looked at those babies in those three groups. After 24 hours, there was no difference in their serum calcium value. So again, we give calcium to try to help mineralize the bones or get them started on mineralization but it probably does not help prevent hypocalcemia. Uh, monitor the serum chemistries every 12 hours in our tiniest babies, ELBW babies, during the first few days of life and then make adjustments as needed. Do not routinely increase maintenance fluids under phototherapy. I know there's a variety of kinds of lights that are used. We're using the LED lights and those lights probably have minimal increase in sensible water loss. All lights in general are vasodilators and sense of water loss does go up. And uh, most importantly, remember this rule about intensive care, that the dumbest kidney in a preterm baby is probably smarter than all of us, the smartest clinician. So once again, thank you very much. It's been a great honor to participating in this Le Legends Forum. Thank you so much, sir. The dumbest kidney being <laughs> Uh, smarter oh, than the smartest clinician is a very good quote we can carry on uh, from now onwards. It was a very interesting talk with a lot of interesting insights. Uh, and we have a, um, a lot of questions already and uh, I would request all the uh, delegates to kindly post your questions in the Q&A box so that your visibility will be more. I now have the pleasure to invite two of the uh, great uh, the neontologists from India, Dr. Bijan Naha and uh, Bijan Saha and uh, Dr. Abhijit to kindly uh, moderate the session. Over to you, both of you. Thank you, Dr. Monoz. Uh, thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation as usual. Sir, what I have learned from your presentation is that I think we, what sir has already told in the last 40 minutes, fluid and electrolyte balance actually it's a dynamic and it's challenging. And in utero, it is done by the placenta. So when the baby is born, it is in the hands of clinician at the bedside. And some of the important points, sir, highlighted that 
during neonatal life, the GFR is low. So the both the potassium secreting and the excreting capacity of the kidney is limited. That is the some of the reasons I think he has highlighted about non-oliguric hyperkalemia. And also he has highlighted the, the three different phases. One is pre-diurotic phase, then diurotic phase, then stable growing phase, then the growing phase. And accordingly, we have to choose our fluid therapy. Another important thing, I think he has highlighted about potassium balance, sodium balance, and also insensible water loss. As usual, as what we have heard from him, that insensible water loss, you can prevent with the babies in incubator or plastic wrap. In this part of the country, we are also, we are also using clean wrap. But I think uh, some, and lastly, what he has said that the dumbest uh, kidney is smarter than the uh, smartest uh, clinician. So what I have, what we have learned from him that if we want to actually optimize fluid and electrolyte balance, we should know the physiology of fluid and electrolyte. That is the reason in the first part of this lecture was full of only physiology. So it is the knowledge of the physician or physiology which makes the trick. So sir, we have got few questions we can ask one by one. Sir, one question is that, so what do you think about humidity in the incubator? It helps to reduce the insensible water loss, but in some places, they say that it is, they have read that they don't use it. That, uh, that they recommend, do you recommend that? Sir? Sure. So we use 75% relative humidity. Our, our nurses do that automatically. And then over seven days, bring it down to 50% relative humidity, which is sort of ambient relative humidity in our nursery. And if you don't do that, if you keep it high, the skin doesn't mature. But on the other hand, in terms of decreasing insensible water losses in the first couple of days of life, I think the relative humidity um, ought to be increased. Again, I mentioned some centers use very high relative humidity. It's okay. As long as you bring it down, and allow the skin to mature. Sir, sir one thing is that uh, what is there in the OS, but here it is a tropical country. The absolute, that relative humidity in this part of the country is always high. So that is another reason perhaps these babies are not losing weight to that environment. So that is in some, in some center here, what we have also told about the plastic wrap, here we are using the clean wrap over the radiant warmer. So it creates a micro environment. So the insensible water loss is limited. Uh, that may be another reason, because in isolate initially also here also if this baby is ALBW less than 500 grams or 700 grams, we keep humidity around 70 percent, and after one we could bring down to 50 percent. But maybe our babies are safe. Maybe the humidity is already high. Maybe 50 percent or more in many places. And and sir, another I want to ask one thing: What is the role of oil application? Does they have any? So, yeah, people have looked at using uh, vegetable oils mm -hmm. to decrease in two things, to decrease mm -hmm. insensible water losses, and secondly, to um, decrease uh, nosocomial infection, healthcare-associated infections. Mm -hmm. So the oils apply to the skin. We have stopped doing this over many years. does decrease insensible water losses. I think it, it does you have to make sure that the oil that you're applying to the skin is free of any pathogens because in the randomized trial of putting on oils to decrease insensible water loss in our country, the babies had actually a higher incidence of nosocomial infections. On the other hand, there's international studies from developing countries which show that the use of those products may decrease nosocomial infection. A side benefit is de decreasing insensible water loss. There's not a ton of studies, but clearly there are some which indicate efficacy for that uh, approach. Yes, sir. Some of the studies in Bangladesh, they have shown that it decreases mortality also and it's a solar and nosocomial infection. And that is in only in the research limited settings. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, Professor uh, Paulin, sir, uh, it was excellent talk. Uh, we have a few more questions. And uh, uh, I always believe that uh, a baby who is uh, in the aquatic life is like a, a naval a soldier or officer who uh, who is as a, a scuba diver. And coming out to the external world becomes an Air Force officer or Air Force general who is totally out of the contact of water. And there plays a very important role of balancing the fluid. And uh, there is a next question which they posted, sir. Uh, uh, Yolanda Pravest has asked, 
that uh, whether the uh, uh, very low birth weight uh, uh, babies or the extremely low birth babies with high urine output and serum sodium is rising what is the best way to catch up with the fluids in these babies that is what he has asked sir so it, the the increase urine output is physiologic to get back to your observation of the scuba diver which always intrigued me i think if people will maybe reflect if they're in a, if they're in a swimming pool in a weightless environment and then climb out of the swimming pool the first thing you want to do is increase is go to the bathroom because it does increase urine output i think that occurs uh and in fact in olden days much older than me before diuretics were used routinely they used to put nephrotic syndrome in a weightless environment and that would promote diuresis so you know getting back to your question the high sensible water loss the high excuse me urine output is physiologic the baby has to get that fluid out of the lung as long as the serum sodium is less than 150 we do not try to replacement Again, because we know this secondary phase of increased sodium output is going to occur. Uh, uh, so it's basically patience, allowing the sodium to rise up to 150, maybe a little higher, and waiting for the secondary phase to jump in. So can it be if there is more insensible water, if the free water uh, loss is more than the sodium? that may lead to increase in sodium level, serum sodium level? In fact, the initial part of the, year of the diuresis is free water. Okay. So if you look at what's coming out, is sodium content is low. And then as you get to the peak of diuresis, the sodium content increases. So yeah, the sodium varies from free water to, in, to naturesis. So just to, uh, just to one to know from if there is more free water loss, how do you handle those babies? Sometimes it is very difficult. I'm sorry, I missed that last question. Uh, sir, uh, if there is more free water loss than sodium, then it is very difficult to actually administer fluid. If you give more fluid, that way there is a risk of opening of PD or uh, NFC, or it's very difficult to actually maintain the fluid balance. No, so we don't increase fluid routinely. We uh, allow those babies to move through their diuresis uh, and uh, provide TPN, but on average, you're getting about our small premature babies, about 100 mLs per kilogram per day, and we're not increasing them from one day to the next. Somebody has asked, is there any role of sodium bicarbonate? I think, uh, I think there's no role. So, uh, question from Mayan Priya Darshini, 31 weaker, uh, 900 grams, severe IUGR, started on parental nutrition and does not lose weight and starts gaining weight on day one itself. Is it normal or why does it happen to a severe IUGR baby and is it a risk factor for BPD and should the fluids be restricted in these babies? So we restrict, that's a great question, we restrict fluids in all the, all the babies. And it's clear that SGA growth restricted babies have different body compartments than their appropriately grown counter counterparts. Um, it's hard to make SGA babies grow, um, but perhaps they start to gain weight, weight a little bit quicker than their AGA counterparts. And again, our goal is to get four grams per kilogram per day of protein, three grams per kilogram per day of lipid, um, and the rest being sufficient calories uh, to provide at least 100 to 120 calories per kilogram per day. And by day two, we're starting all those babies on breast milk or formula. Sir, one question is that when the neonate has edema, what is the best way to determine water intake? A dry weight or just restrict water intake? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I'm, I, about water intake, I know. Uh, sir, a neonate has edema. What is the best way to determine the water intake? Dry weight or just restrict fluid intake? Uh, so dry weight's always better. What is dry weight? Uh, yeah, so, and we use, in general, birth weight. When we're making our calculations for drugs, birth weight for the first couple of weeks of life, and then we start to use the baby's actual weight uh, in making, uh, in, in terms of dosing things. 
sir, we, 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 you, you calculate the drive based on the adequacy of gestation that 50th percentile. I'm sorry, about 50, I heard 50th percentile. Sir, drive it as per the uh, uh, adequacy of gestation that's actually ever appropriate for gestation like in, like in 50th centile, maybe what, what should have what been there? Based on adequacy of gestation, not just like centile. 50th centile or 90th centile, the drive it should be like this. So if we're asking if we change what we do to babies in various centiles, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Most of our babies, when they have the diuresis, fall somewhere about the 10th percentile. Mm -hmm. uh, and the challenge is getting them up around the 25th to the 50th. But we treat all those babies similarly. We, we use uh, nutrition aggressively. And by day three, all babies are receiving some breast milk feedings and TPN uh, to provide uh, maintenance protein, carbohydrate, and lipid. I'm not sure I answered your question, so I apologize. Uh, the next question from Alejandro. He is asking regarding the uh, new protein intake recommendation and the incidence of uh, increase in the feedback syndrome line. So in that condition, uh, should we provide potassium from day one itself? And the second thing he has asked is regarding the uh, inadvertent uh, sodium intake, like by either medication or flushing the letters. So should we carry out a strict balance of the electrolyte intake? So you can't restrict sodium completely. As the, as the questioner asked, you're always giving sodium in, in your uh, in your antimicrobial agents. It's just part of it. But I think uh, the fluid, the potassium restriction is most important for the tiny babies, probably babies less than 750 grams or less. Once you get above a thousand grams, not only your hyperkalemia is so rare that I think you can start to liberalize potassium a little bit sooner. But remember, all babies go through this period of mild increase in potassium and then you come down. But I think it's really the tiniest babies that less than 750 that have this syndrome and adding potassium on day two in a bigger baby is certainly fine. And the tiniest babies are waiting until the diuresis has occurred. Sir, uh, in tiniest baby, those who are losing more uh, sodium, uh, how long you supplement sodium? Suppose the baby is not gaining weight. So in the tiniest babies, we're totally providing enteral nutrition uh, and depends on what kind of milk is available. As you know, if you use a milk bank, which we tend to use in our NICU, those mothers that have mature milk where the sodium concentration is less. So if a baby is becoming hyponatremic and is getting breast milk from a donor, we tend to supplement that by giving extra sodium uh, to the baby. Uh, our preference is always mother's own milk, which has a sodium concentration, which is uh, significantly higher. But also remember, I start off my slides by showing the juncture medullary nephrons and the outer cortical nephrons. The blood flow postnatally is shifting from the juncture medullary nephrons, which have the long loops of Henle to the outer cortical nephrons. And those are also less capable of reabsorbing sodium. So uh, there's an entity people have labeled late hyponatremia prematurity. And some of that has to do with the shift in blood flow from the juncture medullary to the outer cortical nephrons. So one question from Jamil uh, Alkhamadi, what is the maximum PFI in preterm, especially for those who is not gaining weight? Maximum total fluid requirement in a preterm baby who is not gaining weight. So we base everything on their nutritional intake. So in, in a baby on who's not gaining weight enterally, once we're giving about 120 uh, calories uh, per kilo per day, which generally means about 160 mLs per kilogram per day of a um, fortified breast milk or formula or formula, which is 24 calorie per ounce, then we start to add on other nutritional components like um, supplement with protein. Remember, of all the things that make babies gain weight, protein is the most important. Uh, and so we try to supplement with extra protein before before adding extra calories, which makes babies fat, but perhaps not make them gain weight faster.
Uh, one more question they have asked is uh, from Shafiq. Uh, how common is diabetes insipidus in preterm? As there is polyuria with hypernatremia, do make attending to think it in that perspective. So it's, we see it rarely. It's generally a genetic disease when we see it. I, I think yeah, I'm thinking back over the last 20 years in New York, and I think I've seen two babies that actually had that diagnose, diagnosis and were treated with arginine vasopressin, but it's a really rare diagnosis. So another question from Dr. Walla Khalid. During first few days of life, ALBW infants when there is hypernatremia, we are increasing the humidity up to 90%. And increasing the total fluid, what is your opinion about that approach? I think you have already answered this question. Yes, I try not to increase soda fluids if possible. And we and using high humidity is important. But equally important is bringing humidity down to a, a more acceptable range, 50%, even 60%, uh, to allow the insensible water losses to decrease. So we don't increase our fluids. We do use a high humidity environment, but then bring it down over a week. Sir, another question is that if sodium is an extremely uh, preterm infant is 140 to 150 millicovalent per deciliter on day two, three of life, and he has urine output 3 ml per kg uh, per hour, would you add sodium in the parenteral nutrition? I think you have already answered. It is our main aim is to decrease the insensible water loss rather than giving sodium supplementation to these infants. I think this yeah. question is... So yeah, so, so we generally add sodium on average about day two, usually at, at least another milligram per kilogram per day. And by day three or four, once diuresis has occurred, we are giving maintenance sodium, which is usually three milligrams per kilogram per day in our parental nutrition. So I, sh I should have mentioned, maybe I did, that all our babies get parental nutrition beginning on the first day of life. And, we, and electrolyte disturbances are managed by changing the sodium concentration in the TPM. Another question from Dr. Vishal Vishnu Tiwari. Monitoring urine specific gravity is a very easy and inexpensive method for titration of daily fluids as urine specific gravity correlates well with the serum osmolarity. Your comment, please, sir. So I heard he said the, part, the first part, if we can repeat again, please. The first part. What do, the, so what do the, they do? Urine specific gravity is an inexpensive way of monitoring fluid intake. Uh, just uh, he is asking your comment because it is one of the inexpensive way of measuring the urinary specific gravity and that can guide us in fluid administration apart from so, body weight and sodium estimation because in some places are sodium and electrolyte cannot be measured the microchemistry facility is not available in those places whether it can be useful so that's a great question there's a limitation to specific gravity and the babies cannot concentrate the urine at 1020 or 1025, because they haven't established a urea gradient in their kidney, which is the principal mechanism of urinary concentration. So the numbers are all relative. When we say a baby is starting to concentrate the urine, we say the baby's specific gravity is about 1012. You rarely see small premature babies get much above 1015 in a practical application. So it's useful but you have to know the limitations that you're not gonna see babies uh, in the 1020s. It just takes several days until they can concentrate the urine to that level. Uh, one question from Vishnu Rajan. Uh, he is asking regarding the uh, baby having weight loss uh, while fluid restriction in conditions like PDA. So what is the standard fluid collection, uh, calculation in that time? And is calcium and phosphorus supplementation from day one necessary or could it be started along with potassium and sodium on day three? So um, people have looked at whether fluid restriction is important for patent ductus arteriosis. It, it doesn't have a major benefit. If you're giving way too much fluid, sure. If you're giving 150 mLs per kilogram per day, that's probably too much fluid. But within the range of acceptable rates, 100, 100 to 120, fluid restriction does not have a major effect on persistent patency of the ductus arteriosus. And we think nutrition is probably more important. So number one priority is nutrition. Number two priority 
uh, is the patent ductus arteriosus. And your other question is about phosphorus. You said, did you ask a question about phos phosphorus? Sir, another question is from Dr. Mubas Yusra. Which fluid do you use in babies who are not on TPN after 48 hours of life? Like dextrose and normal cellular. He is, asking, he is meaning that dextrose 5% and normal cellular 0.45% or one third. Because in developing countries, we don't have pharmacists who can make tailor made fluid. Sir, he is asking. Sorry. Hello, sir. He's asking, sir, after 48 hours of life, what fluid do you suggest? Because he says in his facility, only available fluid is that dextrose and normal saline. That is means 5% dextrose with 0.45% normal saline or one-third normal saline uh, because they don't have any facility for pharmacies. Yeah, I understand the predicament. So it's, we try to customize those fluids. In our hospital, they can. We can say we're going to give this much sodium there, this much potassium there. We just want to make sure that in babies with RDS, you're not overloading the baby with sodium. So it's okay to give, once the diuresis has occurred, you can calculate it, three milliequivalents per kilogram per day, but you shouldn't be giving six or eight milliequivalents per kilogram per day with your stock solution. So be reasonable on your sodium intake and calculate, it should be an easy calculation to do based on the percentages in the solution you're giving, how much sodium is the baby receiving? And again, we try not to give more than about three milliequivalents per kilogram per day once diuresis has been gone. Sir, uh, if after 48 hours, baby is hemodynamically stable, can you start enteral feet uh, along with... Uh, so that's a great question. I think the best time to start enteral feeds is day one or day two. Because that will be more the available feed, that will be better rather than waiting for the fluid. So day one, we're not very successful. We have an occasional baby who gets breast milk, sometimes a little colostrum on day one from the mother. Day two, if the baby is hemodynamically stable, all babies are getting at least trophic feeds, 20 mLs per kilogram per day of breast milk. And then we increase it every day, a little more slowly in the beginning. But then as they tolerate feedings, we go up to a rate of feeding advancement of about 30 mLs per kilogram per day. But day two is, is the average baby in our unit gets into a feeds on day two. So even day two, if we start the trophic feed and, I, and you increase by 20 to 30 mL by five days or six days, baby will be, can be on full enteral feed. The sooner you start them, you'll get babies on full enteral feeds. I think that's probably true. One question so from Dr. Gautam. Yes, ma'am, carry on. Yeah, one question from Dr. Gautami uh, is that uh, should we do the fluid restriction on day one of life in the case of birth asphyxia in units? In the case of what? I'm sorry, the fluid restriction with what? Asphyxia, sir. Birth asphyxia in units. Sir. In asphyxiated so, neonates, sir. Perinatal asphyxia. asphyxiated neonates. Perinatal asphyxia. Now we're talking about a bigger population of babies. Generally, our asphyxiated neonates are close to the term population. And People have looked at the importance of fluid restriction with HIE, and more important than fluid restriction is providing, having normal hemodynamics. So we provide maintenance fluids to our babies with HIE. It's the term baby, maybe we'll restrict them down to 80 mLs per kilogram per day, but not below that, because there's no good evidence that fluid restriction improves newer developmental outcomes. So most important is hemodynamics, and nutrition is secondary, but not major fluid restriction in our babies with asphyxia. Sir, in perinatal asphyxia, sometimes we do find babies with severe hyponatremia. Uh, like sodium level around 115, 120. So what will be the strategy in those infants? Those babies need more sodium. So I, one of the first papers I ever wrote, a hundred seems like a hundred years ago, was um, babies with perinatal asphyxia who had increased sodium output following the asphyxiating event. And some of those babies sometimes need four or five, 
six milliequivalents per kilogram per day because they're losing sodium in the urine. But if the serum sodium is falling, I, here we would always measure the fractional excretion of sodium and try to match that increased sodium output by providing more sodium intake. So you can tell where the sodium is going in a baby who's becoming hyponatremic, who's been asphyxiated, the fractional excretion of sodium will be high. And an average term baby is probably about 1%. Uh, can we see that fractional excretion of sodium in those infants, whether it is excreting more in the urine or not? And accordingly, we can try to do fluid. Sorry, the question is? So, so in asphyxiated, uh, perinatal asphyxia, as you are saying that we have to supplement sodium in those infants, as you are saying that there will be more sodium loss in the urine. So can we measure the fractional excretion of sodium that we can have? Uh, that can give us more, better, better way. Yeah, we would, we would always measure fractional excretion of sodium because you need, you know, it needs only a spot urine and blood specimen for sodium and creatinine. So it's, it's a real, it's not a time urine collection. So it's a pretty easy way of measuring what the fractional excretion of sodium is. And again, in a term baby, it's around 1%. And if you see 5 or 6%, that tells you that the baby's wasting sodium okay. and will need extra sodium in the uh, parental nutrition. Sir, uh, uh, one question from Vishnu Rajan, weight loss, while the fluid restriction in condition like PDA, what would be the standard fluid calculation? For PDA? See, he is asking in a baby with PDA, uh, you want to restrict fluid. So what would be the standard fluid calculation? How much fluid should be given? So, our, so again, with PDA, our most the first thought is always nutrition. So we want to make sure the baby is getting adequate calories. And that may mean concentrating the TPN a little bit more and restricting fluids down. But in general, those babies are still getting about 120 mLs per kilogram per day parentally. So we don't restrict it down to 80. And again, fluid restriction for PDA Sounds like it's a good thing to do, but there's no good evidence that it really makes a difference. Uh, one question from uh, uh, Mare Perez. He wants to know how soon can we start the trophic feeds in asphyxiated, asphyxiated newborns, parental asphyxia babies, with the poor up GAR score? So that's a great question, and nobody knows the answer. But I would tell you, if you look at the cell renewal time in the newborn intestine, it's a couple of days. So I, I keep babies NPO, usually for about 72 hours, give them parental nutrition, and then introduce uh, enteral feedings back. It's a, it's, a, it's a gray zone in neonatology. Sir, uh, Dr. Ruby Khanna is asking, if a baby is not going into a diuretic phase, Despite fluid restrictions, can we give diuretics to hasten fluid loss? No, people have looked at giving no. diuretics in RDS, and it's absolutely of no benefit that I that I know of. So, no, I would not. I, I would not do it. I remember babies with, who are with severe lung disease injury are often have very late diuresis. So instead of seeing on day two or day three, you may see on day five to day seven, and. Uh, in those babies, we would never administer diuretics. Besides, diuretics like Lasix uh, increase the likelihood of patency of the ductus arteriosus. Another input's pretty. Ductus can open after diuretic therapy, rather. Which which babies on diuretics? Any baby on diuretics. Suppose a baby is on PDA. Diuretics may be counterproductive, sir. So again, um, Lasix releases prostaglandins and prostaglandins keep the ductus okay. arteriosus patent. So we tend not to use diuretics okay. in babies with a PDA. We may restrict fluids a little bit, but never rest restrict nutrition. One more question from uh, Zhang Zi. He wants to know that in a case of a very low birth weight or extremely low birth weight baby, who is already on full feeds and is having hyponatremia. Is it all right to give oral sodium chloride to correct hyponatremia or does it have a risk of NEC? 
So that's a great question. And we give oral supplemental sodium in the feeds. So uh, we're mixing it with the, with the breast milk with the formula. And that is exactly what we do in our NICU if they have developed hyponatremia. I need to interrupt. Uh, uh, <laughs> Professor Paulin, how much time do we have for, for the question? Or do we wrap up? So how much time do you need? How about another five minutes? Is that possible? I, oh, yes. I think we will wrap wrap up in another, uh, because the moderators kindly wrap up in another five minutes. Like, right, right, right. It's, a, it's such a huge honor for Professor Paulin to be with us, but I, he's a busy person. So we should, we should I mean, uh, stick to the time as well. Huh? So, I think one or two questions can be, you can discuss, I then we can wrap up. Yes, please. Sir. Uh, so next question was, what would be the fluid restriction in day one in perinatal asphyxia? I think this question has already been answered. Right. Uh, second question is that, uh, I know that, how soon do you start trophy feedings in asphyxiated newborns with poor upper score? So what, what kind of feedings? Uh, formula uh, trophic, feeding? feedings? Trophic, for, oh, trophic. Trophic feedings. Yeah. Yeah. So asphyxiated babies, we generally wait for about 72 hours before trophic feeds. Um, depends on the degree of asphyxia or how severe the perinatal depression was. And if it was mild, then, then starting feeds by day two seems reasonable to me. So, so I think this will be the last question. Dr. Ramesh is asking, renal bicarbonate loss and consequent of metabolic acidosis in ALBW infants. Sir, in bicarbonate loss in urine in a yale vitamin infant and resulting metabolic acidosis. So I'm not sure of the question, but bicarbonate, the most common loss of bicarbonate occurs from giving too much fluid to baby, mm -hmm. and that causes the metabolic acidosis. So you see that the, uh, on electrolytes, you see that the CO2 is, is quite low. So, but your question relates, bicarbonate losses do occur because some babies lose bicarbonate in the urine and my thought is always in those babies, fluid restriction to try to get them to hold on to more uh, sodium and bicarbonate in their kidney. Sir, he's asking that because of the bicarbonate loss, there is metabolic acidosis. Uh, right, it can. Is he asking how to treat that? <laughs> so we try to give uh, sodium citrate in our TPN in babies that are getting, uh, or sodium acetate, babies who are getting metabolic acidosis. So we change, we go away from sodium chloride and use sodium citrate or sodium acetate, and that will almost always correct the metabolic acidosis. So actually what happens in, the, in many parts of the, this part of the country, this sodium acetate is not available. That is the disadvantage sometimes. You have sodium acetate, citrate? Sodium acetate uh, is not, sodium acetate is not as available. That may be a disadvantage in this part of the country. Yeah, that, that's how we would treat it. We tend not to give bicarbonate to babies. We tend to treat it just by changing the formulation of sodium. Excellent. I think uh, with permission from Sir and Dr. Manoz, we can wrap up. Thank you very much, Sir. Actually, it was uh, we were privileged to have you with us, and it, we have heard your books, we have your articles, but this was a great privilege so to moderate the session with such a huge personality like you, sir. Thank you once again. I think all our readers, viewers, they will be very much benefited from this talk. Thank you very much. I think we can go over to Dr. Manoj. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Bijan and Dr. Abhijit for uh, moderating this session and uh, uh, kindly sticking to the time. Uh, uh, Professor Paulin, we have, I mean, our admiration for you is growing in leaps and bounds. I ca consider you one of, as one of the coolest and the most practical neonatologists whom we have heard of and uh, that that was of my first impression and every talk of your lecture of yours which i heard uh, most of them in the hypocrat seminars in various parts of the world uh, i mean it it just you know like it keeps growing it is such a um, the wisdom from the knowledge how to get it is uh, probably from lectures like this so uh, again, it was an amazing lecture. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for sharing your time for us. 
hoping to have you with us in um, uh, in person in the subsequent future uh, from all of us team learn from the legends uh, thank you so much thank you thank you very much and at the, uh, 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 before we close i would also like to thank all the delegates who are attending uh, this session from various parts of the world in various time frames because we are live in uh, uh, other two platforms as well and then the youtube link will be available uh, for those who missed the session in the different time zones so thank you so much for being with us for the last two years and then the, now the third year is going on so it is such a huge honor to have you all with us friends uh, you are invited to the upcoming session as well the next session is scheduled on 4th of august thursday at the same time 7 30 pm indian time uh, the uh, topic is non-invasive ventilation modes in 2022 and beyond and the faculty is professor rengasami ramanathan from the university of southern california usa until then thank you so much thank you thank, thank you. you thank you all thank you sir thank you sir thank, thank you, you, thank you sir. Sir. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Manoj sir. Thank you, Ravi sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi sir. 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 Thank you, Ravi sir.